that I'm uh, covering with you in these three weeks, you do this as one lesson because it's all a discourse unit. But it's a larger discourse unit that's made up of three smaller discourse units. So that's why I'm, I wanted to slow us down and to really walk through this very rich passage of Scripture. Now, last Sunday, we saw that Paul opens the book of Colossians by praying for his friends at Colossae, some of whom he knew and most of whom he did not, but he loves them all. He, he knows the pastor, of this, the pastor of this church is right there in Rome in prison with Paul at his side while he's under house arrest ministering to him. Onesimus the, uh, was the household servant of his friend uh, uh, Philemon and he's thinking about Philemon and, he, and uh, Aristarchus and Archippus and you know they're just they are all these folks that he knows some people in that church and he's concerned about them and he loves them and he he can imagine he's met Christians all over the Mediterranean world even the folks he didn't know he still loved them he imagined what their lives were like and he yearned for all of them to be experiencing and living out the fullness of, of the gospel, the fullness of the life in Christ. And so uh, he begins, before he even starts instructing them in the letter, he begins by praying for them. And last week we saw that uh, the, the things that Paul was giving thanks for in their lives, their uh, faith in Christ, their love for all the saints, and the hope that was laid up for them in heaven. Oh man, I, I left last week so encouraged because we had looked at that together. I thought about that. And, so th this past week, I, I was a bit sick this past week. And I had to teach all week in a winter session, so that was a struggle. Thank God for steroid shots. I got one of those Wednesday night, and that helped me over the hump. So today I'm, I'm with you now. But I, I was mostly encouraged by what we looked at last week. Today, we move from, in Paul's prayer, from his thanksgiving into his petition. So Paul's going to ask something Ask God to do something for these folks in Colossae. So uh, let, let's look at the passage. Here's what the passage says. And so, from the day we heard, that is, remember, heard about their faith, heard about their love, heard about the hope laid up for them in heaven. So from the day we heard about you, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now I'll give you a little preview of next week. We're not going to do this whole passage. We're going to stop. Uh, with the first part of verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. And next week, uh, we're going to take a whole uh, lesson to look at the four things that Paul is specifically giving thanks to the Father for. So that'll be next week's lesson. Now this week, um, I've entitled this, What Would Your Best Life Really Look Like? 16 years ago, uh, televangelist, Houston televangelist, Joel Osteen, published a book, uh, entitled Your Best Life Now, and I don't know if you've ever read it. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I, maybe if you're a Joel Osteen fan, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, but uh, I, you know, he's, he's not my cup of tea uh, for lots of reasons, but boy, am I an outlier. Man, because uh, you know, over 8 million people have bought this book. It was, new, it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for self-help books. Stayed on the bestseller list for, for two years. And, uh, and now, just last time I checked in, it was 8 million copies. It's probably over 10 million now. Uh, but your best life now. Love the title, though. What a, that's a catchy title. You're, you want, oh, yeah, you want to live your best life now. 
Well, Osteen's message is, it's, it's a part of his, the general prosperity gospel, and he talks about rising above our obstacles to achieve health and abundance and victory. Well, who wouldn't want more of that? And so we can live successful and prosperous and fulfilling lives. There's not much about dealing with sin in there, and there's not much about sacrifice and suffering, and there's, there's not much about the harder parts of the Christian life. But, uh, man, all these... You know, the content of the book pretty much goes with the grin on his face on the cover. So that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm, I, I'm not all that taken with Osteen is I, I yearn, you know, he says some nice things, but uh, I, I yearn for something a little uh, tougher and deeper. I, I, know, I know life isn't all that easy and uh, as positive thinking, but he's got a good idea, though. What would your best life look like? And would you like to live your best life now? Okay, uh, I'll take that. Uh, 20 centuries ago, though, uh, somebody else answered that question, and they answered it with the real gospel, not a prosperity gospel, and they gave us an answer that really has teeth in it and really works. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossian church about how to live their real best life. And in this prayer, what Paul is praying for the Colossians, this is a description of, of what the best life actually looks like. And not only is Paul just describing it and saying, well, here it is, uh, you folks, uh, y'all get your, get your energy up and go, go after it, here it is. Uh, no, he's telling us how we can experience this best life now. So here's the question, what would your best life really look like? Now, I want to show you in this passage, because there are a couple of things, uh, there, there are several things we're going to be doing in this passage. And uh, uh, by the way, all the colored words are verbs. So when you're looking at a passage of Scripture and you want to figure out, well, what's going on, first thing you do, you look at the verbs. And in this passage of Scripture, uh, you can probably tell that's English on the left, Greek on the right. You don't need to be able to read the Greek, but... Just see, uh, hey, this is where we're working off the Greek verbs here. We're going to read it in English, though. Uh, Paul, in this prayer, the main verb is up there in the second line of verse, uh, of verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased. That's green because that's an indicative verb. And then what follows is two participles to pray and asking. That, that's describing the act. This is what Paul hasn't stopped doing. He's not stopped praying for the Colossians and asking God for something. Now, that's the one thing that's happening in this whole... Only one thing is happening in this passage. That's it. Paul is praying. That's the main verb. Paul says, I haven't stopped praying. All the rest of this is the content of what Paul is praying. So Paul is doing one thing, he's praying, but he's praying that three things would happen, that the Colossians would have three things, that they would be filled with three things. That's his prayer. And the three things that Paul is asking God to fill the Colossians with are knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. By the way, we're going to slow this down. I'm getting, this is an overview. We're going to, we'll go back through this step by step. So he's praying that they be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And then in verse 10, uh, our brother, uh, yes, uh, so as, verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Now that's why... That's the result that Paul is looking to see in their lives. He wants them to be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding so that their daily lives would be the kind of lives that were worthy of the Lord and fully pleasing to Him. And then what follows, you'll see that there are four verb phrases. They're actually participial phrases in blue. That life that is fully pleasing to the Lord and worthy of Him is described by four things. So that's where we're going today. Paul is doing one thing here. He's praying. Praying that the Colossians be filled with something. That they be filled with three things. And those three things will result in one thing, a life that's fully pleasing to the Lord. 
And that one thing is described by four things. So I don't have a 15-point sermon here, but you'll see the lesson is simpler. By the way, if you laid it out, if you, if you like propositional outlines, uh, this is how uh, it would uh, line out there. And you'll see that those four participles, I've got them at the bottom of the page, bearing fruit, increasing in knowledge, strengthened with power, giving thanks. That's where we're going today. So let's look at the first of them. First of all, what is Paul doing? Paul prayed for his friends to be filled with spiritual knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. There you see in the first part of verse 9 that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Those are three, import those are three things that are important to your best life now. In order to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, worthy of Him, in order to live the kind of life that you really want to live, your best life, you're going to need a steady inflow of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. First, first. Uh, now, Paul prayed for his friends to be filled with knowledge. Knowledge, that's a strong word. It's a strong word in English. It's a strong word in, in Greek, epikonosis. It, and it means to know, not to guess. Uh, you know that you know. Paul didn't... I'm hearing music from... <laughs> that, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, oh, okay, a cell phone. Uh, Paul wanted his listeners to know, not guess at, not wonder, not suppose what the Lord's will was, but he wanted them to have knowledge of God's will. So that, that's a strong promise, it's a strong ask, it's a strong idea. And it means a deep and thorough grasp of all God's word and all God's ways. This is a prayer, honestly, that, Paul, that God would give them a complete understanding of everything he wants them to do. And by the way, that is what the Lord wants for you. He doesn't want you to guess at what a life that's pleasing to him is life. Uh, he doesn't want you to guess and wonder and worry about, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What should I do? Where should I go? I mean, these are questions that all human beings wrestle with. But what God has in mind for you is God wants you to know what direction you're going. And that's why Paul is praying this. He knows that they're going to need this knowledge. But he also prayed for them to have spiritual wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to use and apply the knowledge that we have. So it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to know how to take that knowledge and to do something practical with it, how to put it into practice, how to use it, how to... Uh, I know lots of things that I haven't a clue what to do with them. Uh, but you, you want your knowledge to... to to have wisdom so that you know what to do with it. And then he prayed for them to have understanding, insight, discernment, uh, the ability to grasp the meaning of things to, to make a right decision in every situation. Have, have you ever wrestled with learning something and, and you start and maybe you started out and you learn the facts about it and maybe you can even memorize some formulas and stuff. I know that the value of pi several de is 3.14159 to seven, but I, you know how to put that into practice. I sometimes struggle. Where to put that into practice? Uh, you know, I know lots of different things. I know that William the Conqueror across the English Channel, October of 1066, fought the Battle of Hastings, became the first Norman king of England. But that didn't do me any good this last week with a sore throat. So, you know, there. So you, you sometimes you start to get things, and then you might start to see a clear picture of what you could do with it. But then, you know, there comes that moment that, and usually, here's how we say, "I get it, I get it," and yeah, I got, I got it, I got it. You know, and someone's explaining where to go or how to do something. And you're listening, and they're wondering, okay, okay, have you, have you, have you, are you there? Are you? Have, oh, I, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then, and then the talk, when you get it, the talking stops, and you swing into action when you get it. Oh, I got it, I got it. So that's, that's what Paul is praying, this, that they have an, a, be filled. Filled is the word. 
with knowledge of God's will, with spiritual wisdom and understanding. All right, here's a question for you. What do a monkey's tail, an elephant's trunk, a giraffe's tongue, and a human hand all have in common? By the way, that's my little grandson, Pat, and, uh, Pat's, uh, and my grandson, Roman, and he's feeding a giraffe at the zoo there, and you'll see that giraffe's tongue is wrapping around uh, the, uh, uh, the leaf there. Let me see this. If this, I'm not sure if the, this is a video, but uh, I don't think I've got that. Uh, uh, and it's it's not playing video, but anyway, he, you can see how tickled he was that the giraffe uh, took it. The giraffe wraps his tongue around the around the leaf. All right, here's what they have in common: all of these, a giraffe's tongue, monkey's tail, elephant's trunk, a human hand. These are prehensile organs. A prehensile organ is an organ that's adapted for grasping or wrapping around something. And the same thing, you pick up, I, I walked in, I'm holding a twigger, I walked in with a coffee cup. I can, look at, isn't this amazing? I can do this because I have a prehensile tongue. Well, the monkey can hang from a branch by his tail the elephant can pick up a log with his trunk, and the giraffe can grasp a leaf with his tongue because all of these are prehensile organs. It's related to the word apprehend. You hear that? Prehensile, apprehend. When the police apprehend a criminal, they've got him. They get a hold of him. They get a hold of him. And it's also, also related to our word comprehend. And to comprehend means to grasp an idea, to wrap your mind about it. And this is what Paul is praying for the Colossians, that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's word and will, that they would be filled up with knowing everything they need to know about who God is and who they are and what God wants for them, that they would be filled with that wisdom of knowing how to put that into practice, and that all of this would result in their understanding, in their comprehending, in their grasping it. Paul wants to, is praying that through the Word of God and the Spirit of God, that these Colossians would come to the point where they understand what the, the life God calls them to live, and that they would say, ah, I've got it, and then they would get up and, and go out and live it. Boy, my hope is that there would be something here today, and I've been praying for you that something we studied together today, even just some small spiritual <laughs> insight, some, maybe some new uh, bit of truth that you see out of this passage that, that you would say, oh, yeah, I, oh, I like that. Oh, that's helpful. And, and, and then you'd say, oh, I got it. I got it. And then this week you would think about some way that you're going out uh, to do it. Uh, next week, if you come back and, and you look at me and say, hey, you're, you remember what you said about X? Lab? Well, I got it. That would be the greatest compliment you could pay me as a teacher. Well, that's what Paul's praying for. And he prays for them to be filled with these things. It's a prayer that they be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. The Greek word there, New Testament word, uh, pleroo, means to fill completely, to, to make full, to make complete, to supply all that's needed. Now, let me ask you a question. That, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. But do you think Paul would pray for something that was a pipe dream for a group of people? Uh, that, that was just, well, let me just take my best shot and I hope this happens. Or do you think Paul honestly expected God to answer this prayer and to do in their lives what he was praying? I, I don't think it was a shot in the dark. I think Paul knew good and well that this is what God wanted for them, that this was according to his will, and that if he asked, God would grant this. By the way, you've probably already caught on that I'm going to suggest that this is something that we could pray for ourselves and pray for the people we love. And uh, I get, I, here, here's a guarantee. It's not my guarantee. It's from the Lord. If you prayed for yourself to be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding from God. 
or you prayed that for someone you loved, do you think that that is a prayer that's according to the will of God? If you do, raise your hand. Well, you know it's according to the will of God. It comes right out of the Word of God. Well, does God answer prayers that are according to His will? Raise your hand. There you go. All right. Well, get to it. Uh, this, this is something that's going to do something for you. Here's the second thing. Why does Paul, this, this is the one thing that Paul is praying. He's praying that they be filled with these three things. That's his prayer. But there's a purpose to this. And the purpose is, it starts there in verse 10. This is what Paul is knowing. He knows that this filling of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding will do something. It will help them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing, fully pleasing to Him. That's the point. Paul prayed for his friends so that they would honor the Lord in their daily living and please Him in every way. That's the one purpose of this prayer, is that this would happen in the lives of these believers. Now, I like the way Paul puts it there. He, he says that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The uh, New Testament word, peripateo, it, it literally means to walk around. That's, that's what the word means, to walk around, worthy of the Lord. As I go about, I'm walking around, worthy of the Lord. Well, that means, I mean, you, you, throughout the, you walk throughout your day. You go places. You, I got up this morning. Uh, I went in the kitchen. Uh, I was so excited about this lesson. I woke up wide awake at 430 <laughs> went back into the study, and, and uh, I, I think I changed about a fourth of the lesson. I was so excited about it and had been praying the, for the Lord to, hey, give a little something extra here. And uh, so I was so excited. So I walked in the study, walked in the bathroom, got myself showered and dressed, walked to Starbucks. We grabbed a bagel, and uh, I got a large seat. We walked here. We get done. We're going to walk here. You're going to walk everywhere you go today. So this is a great metaphor to describe you as you are going about your day. And Paul is praying for, the, for every place you go, everything you do, every person you see, he's praying that that be worthy of the Lord. So all day long, everywhere you go, everything you do, every person you see, every place you are, the idea is that the life you live, moment by moment, step by step, everywhere you go, that, that everything you do is pleasing to the Lord. Um, I just, I didn't really like the girl that waited on me at Starbucks this morning. Uh, she was new, she was slow, she got my order wrong, she overcharged me, it took me way too long. I thought I was going to be late. Uh, I thought about getting short with her, and then I thought about the lesson that, well, okay, <laughs> I'm supposed to be walking around fully pleasing to the Lord, and would he want me to be short with this girl? Uh, no, I don't think that'd honor him, so I just smiled and was patient and, and took my time. So, but I, I had to, the Lord had to remind me of that because I wasn't going to do it naturally. Uh, remember, I'm the great man that the crap, you know, the traffic must part and let the great man through. You know, I, the impatient self. I, you know what? I don't mind confessing that to, to you because as one selfish, self absorbed, clutching ball of self interest, I'm talking to a whole room full of other selfish, self absorbed balls of self interest. So, it, this way where this is our sinful nature. But the Lord has something better for us, and, and this is it. So walking around. Well, that, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the reason for the prayer. Now, what happens next? Paul, in this passage, describes those, these four blue phrases. In the Greek New Testament, those are four participles. I love participles. Participles are adjectives that have night jobs working as, or they're verbs that have night jobs working as adjectives. And adjectives <laughs> describe things. And so these four participles describe what a life that's fully pleasing to the Lord looks like. So this is, while this is point number three, it's actually a different kind of thing. Paul's praying one thing, fill them with knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. He prays that one thing so that they would do one thing, live a life that's fully pleasing to the Lord. And now we're going to see four things that would describe what that life that is fully pleasing to the Lord looks like. Here's the first one. Paul prayed for his friends so that they would lead fruitful lives. Look there at the first one. 
walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. That's the first characteristic of your best life. It's going to be a fruitful life. You're going to bear fruit in every good work. Now, that's a common metaphor all through the New Testament. Bearing fruit is, the, the Christian life is constantly described as bearing fruit. Uh, probably the, the thing that first comes to mind is Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the kinds of things that flow out of a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, who is filled with Christ. This, a heart where Christ lives, where the Holy Spirit is working, the life that God blesses is going to be filled with this kind of fruit. And Jesus said that his followers would be known by their fruit, identified by their fruit. Look at this in Matthew 7. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Well, no. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruits, you will recognize them. Now, I can identify a few trees. I recognize a pine tree when I see one. Uh, a pecan tree, it usually, I, I couldn't tell you, if, if there weren't pecans on the ground, I couldn't tell you a pecan tree from a rhododendron. I just, I, you know, I, I, I just know, know beans about trees, so I couldn't identify trees. But if you send me to Kroger for a bag of apples, I'm not going to bring you back a bunch of bananas. I know my fruit. I know <laughs> grapes, kumquats, pears. I, 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 know, I know far more fruits than I do trees. And Jesus said that by their fruit, you will know them. You can identify now, it, it's interesting, of, of an apple tree, why does an apple tree produce apples? Anybody got a guess at that? Anybody want to venture a guess? The way God made it. What's that? The way God made it. Well, it, it's, it, it's an apple tree. That's exactly right. <laughs> why does a thorn bush produce thorns? Why well, it's, it's a thorn bush. Now, the, a thorn bush can't do anything except produce them. A thorn bush is never going to grow the first apple. And apple trees don't grow thorns as fruit. They grow apples. That's because it is an apple tree. And so the, the lesson Jesus is saying, look, it's, this, this is not a list of things that you do. That love, joy, peace, patience, those are things you ought to look for in your life to tell whether or not you're connection with with Christ is what it ought to be but that's not a list of things for you to do that's a list of fruit that you ought to look for and trust God to produce in your life uh, now if it's not there it tells you something's wrong with the faith connection but it's this is he's praying for fruitful lives if you want to understand this principle of where your Christian fruit comes from there is no better place to look than John 15 because that's where the Lord, the night before he was crucified, gives us this beautiful metaphor. Actually, it's probably a parable of the true vine, the heavenly vine. John 15, Jesus describes the union, and that's the right word. It's, it's a union between himself and the believer. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. When you become a Christian, you are in a living union, organic union with the Lord Jesus. And he describes this union as a permanent living connection between a branch and the vine to which it belongs. That's exactly what he's saying. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now, in that living union between the vine and its branches, Listen, let, let this sink in. This may be the one thing that blesses you the most today. The vine supplies 
all the life-giving sap that the branch needs to produce much fruit. Now, by the way, does God expect us to be fruitful? You bet he does. In fact, in John 15, three times Jesus talks about the branches in him bearing fruit. He says that he talks about you're designed to bear fruit, and then he says more fruit, and then he says much fruit. So what are you supposed to produce? Fruit. And after you've produced fruit, what do you do? You produce more fruit. And after you've produced more fruit, what do you do? You produce much fruit. In other words, you don't stop producing fruit. But it's not the branch that produce the branch produces the fruit, but it doesn't do it by itself. The vine draws up moisture and nutrients from the soil. The vine turns that moisture and those nutrients into a life-giving sap and energy that goes out to the branches and because the branches are connected to the vine, they produce the fruit. By the way, this is one of the happiest and most restful things I know about the Christian life. And that is that it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. And in the parable of the vine in John 15, there are only two imperative verbs in that passage. There are only two commands that are given to us. Now, it talks about all this fruit we produce, but the only two commands are, Jesus said, abide in me, and then he says, ask whatever you wish. Wow. Wait a minute. That's how my fruit gets produced? That's how I live a fruitful life? Yep. What I need to do is to make sure that I'm connected to Christ and not to this world. I'm connected to Him. I'm focused on Him. And, and I'm, I'm not focused on and loving and following the things in this world. I'm keeping my faith in Him what it should be. Your part is to be attached to Him. His part is to live His life through you. I wish I had time to just, I wish I had time to spend a few weeks with you in John 15. Maybe I can fill in another time we'll do that. But this is, this is what Paul is after. He's after them bearing a fruitful life. I love that. Here's the next part of simple. Paul prays for his friends so that they would increase in knowledge. Now, he's praying for them to be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And a part of that is that as you begin to bear fruit in your Christian life, you don't stop growing and knowing. You continue to grow in your knowledge. You continue to grow in your understanding. Christian faith is a living thing. Living things grow. If it's real, it grows. And so you, there's not a time when you've learned enough about Christ, enough about the Father, enough about the Spirit, enough about... There's never a time when we learned enough. There will always be some room for us to grow. By the way, that's one of the reasons... I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my late 60s now. Uh, I haven't got the first clue as to when I would be interested in retiring. Because one, I still enjoy what I'm doing, and number two, I'm still getting better at it. I'm still growing, I'm still learning. And so it is in the Christian life. That, uh, I'm, I'm, still, I'm excited each day to open up God's Word because I'm still growing, I'm still learning. That's because your faith is alive. That's our little grandson when he was one. Uh, Pat went back, held him for a family wedding. You know what? Uh, that's the laziest child. Uh, everybody else walked into the church on their own steam. He insisted that Pat carried him. Uh, of course, he couldn't walk at the time, but, uh, and so we, we cut him some slack. Came time for lunch. Little fella didn't pick up the first fork. Sat there and made somebody else feed him a bottle. Uh, of course, he, he didn't know how to feed himself then. And then, uh, I mean, instead of going to the bathroom and, and taking, I mean, just, you know, just dumped his lunch right in his pants and made somebody else change it. Now, we didn't mind doing that when he was less than one because, well, you, everybody does that for a baby. You expect a baby, baby can't feed himself, can't change himself, can't clothe himself. He, he, he needs you to put him down when he gets a nap. But when he's 25, we expect him to be able to do those things for himself. And so it is in the Christian life that, you, you ought to be bearing fruit and need to be making some progress. You need to be growing in your knowledge, and Paul prays for that. So are you growing in your spiritual life? It's a good question. Are you making progress? Do you have a deeper love for God and a deeper love for His Word? 
Are you walking in a more perfect obedience? So uh, let's see. I think we're, uh, we're down now. This is our third participle. Paul prayed for his friends so that they would be strong enough to endure to the end. Look at there. The, verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Number one, bearing fruit in every good work. Number two, increasing in the knowledge of God. And then look at this third one. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That's a long one there. But Paul is praying that they would be strengthened with the power of God in their inner man so well that, uh, that they would be able to endure to the end. And here's the deal. The Christian life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. You know, sprint, you know see sprinters, woo! That's why you can, you know, uh, uh, that's uh, our Olympic sprinter, uh, Udo Bolt. Uh, and the, these guys, they, they're leaning forward and they're going... They're huffing and puffing. They're going fast, fast, fast. You can't run a marathon at that pace. Look, look at those marathon runners. They, they look, so, you know, they're, they're upright. And uh, why? Because they got to run 24, you know, what, 24.6 miles or 26.4, one or the other. Uh, more miles than I want to run. But the Christian life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. And so Paul is praying for them to be strengthened with power so that they would be able to go all the way to the end. Now, I love this. Paul's prayer is that they would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. He's not praying that the Colossians, oh Lord, help those Colossians to be all that they can be. Nope, that's not the prayer. Help the Colossians to be as strong as they can possibly be. Nope, that's not the prayer. The prayer is, Father, I want you to fill them with your power so that they will be strengthened, not according to their strength, their resources, their might, but according to your glorious might. And the same power by which Christ rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sat down exalted at the right hand of the Father, that same power is at work in each one of us. It's just a matter of your knowing that and believing that and stepping out in faith to walk in that. I, I, I tell you what, I'm a pretty rotten human being, honestly, underneath the surface. I'm about as selfish and, uh, and worldly in, in my broken natural self as, as the worst criminal. Paul said of himself, I'm the worst of sinners. I know exactly what he, what he means. But there's a reason that my broken, selfish human nature doesn't ruin my life every day. There's another power that is uh, moment by moment and day by day and year by year that is transforming that broken nature that I inherited from my father Adam and is recreating in me the, the person of Christ. Now, I still make mistakes because that process isn't done yet, but I'll tell you what, I'm happy to tell you that it's getting better, and I'm really happy about that because I'd like to be more like Christ and less like me. And, and the nice thing is that the, it's not because I try harder and harder. It's because I trust with a deeper and deeper trust. And, and there's a big difference. Uh, I'd love to, we'd love to do some lessons on that uh, sometime. Let me close with this one. This is the last participle. Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in knowledge, being strengthened with all power, and then giving thanks to the Father. You want a, a life that's pleasing to God is not a life where you are complaining about a whole bunch of stuff. It's a life where you are giving thanks to the Father moment by moment for everything that comes your way. Uh, you're, and we're, I'm going to save it for next week because next week Paul names four, four specific things that we can thank the Father for that he's doing because we, we are in Christ. But you stop and think about this. Your, your life is a veritable cornucopia <coughs> of good stuff that God pours into your lap every day. Even I've discovered that, that sometimes the greatest, I, almost every time, every major setback and defeat <coughs> that I've had in my life, every painful experience I have had in my life so far, 
has over the course of time, sometimes quickly and sometimes over a longer period of time, has worked out for my good and God's glory. It's amazing. When you, when you live your life in faith, you start to know stuff that would crush other people make you grow. Wow. Uh, it, 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 it's amazing. You know, Paul says in, in Romans that, uh, in, that God works in everything for our good and His glory. Now, he doesn't say that everything that happens to you is good, but he says that in everything, He's working for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Not everything that goes into a cake tastes good by itself. You're not going to sit down and just eat a raw egg, uh, unless you're a, a Rocky-type boxer, and uh, even then I don't think He's going to. You're not going to sit down and eat a cup of flour. Even a, a cup of sugar doesn't taste all that good by itself in, in that quantity. But you put all that stuff together and put it in the oven at 350 degrees for a while, you got a pretty nice cake comes out. Well, so it is in life. Even the hard things that happen are things that we can give thanks for. And then our lives are just full of good things. I woke up and uh, turned this morning, and there's this lady that shared my bed in my home. My family bore my children for uh, 45 years this summer. Uh, she was still there. I was happy about that. Uh, I got up and everything still works. And uh, I was happy about that. And uh, I had a choice about where I ate breakfast. I got more, I, I'm not a rich man, but like every one of you, I've got more money in my wallet to walk out of a grocery store with more food than I can carry. And most of the people who are across the world and have existed over in time have, have lived subsistence lives. We don't do that. I had a choice about what I'd wear this morning. Uh, I had a choice. It's amazing. I, the cornucopia, our lives are, are full of blessings. We often aren't thankful because we take them for granted. We don't notice them. Uh, we expect, we start to envy and covet. And when, Actually, if you just sit and look at what God has poured into your lap this morning, you think, you, you know what, I don't have any complaints. I got good reason to be thankful. So there it is. Paul prayed this prayer for his friends. And here's my question for you. Might we pray it for ourselves and the people we love? And remember, the prayer is really just for one thing, that God fill us with spiritual knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Let me ask you this. What are you doing to tap into knowledge and wisdom and understanding? Here's how I do it. Uh, by the way, I love my paper Bible, uh, but uh, I do most of my Bible reading through my phone because I've got a nice app. I use the Olive Tree Bible app and because uh, I always have my phone with me, I always have my Bible with me. I have my Bible reading plan with me. This, uh, this year I'm reading the old McShane plan. I read four chapters a day, uh, two from the uh, uh, Old Testament and two morning, re uh, Old Testament, New Testament morning reading, Old Testament, New Testament evening reading. And uh, you can see there we're on the 12th day of the year and I'm on track. That, that little app keeps me on track, pulls up my reading, because I just touch the buttons. It takes me right. This, this is my plan. I got a plan. I got, I, I'm not just sitting around, well, one day I hope God will fill me with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Nope, I got a plan. I got a tool. I got a tool. I got a way of wrapping my hand and my head and my heart around some knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And as I read, I'm praying that the Lord... Lord, fill me with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding so I can lead that best life now so that I can lead a life that's fully pleasing to you. So there's my question. And the goal of Paul's prayer was just one thing, that his friends would honor the Lord in their daily living and please him in every way. And that's my prayer for you. Let's stop for just a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful prayer that your servant Paul once prayed for the believers at Colossae. Yes. And Father, right now, with full confidence that this is your will because we've seen it in your word, I pray now that you would fill us with knowledge of your will and with spiritual wisdom and understanding. I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Christ in our hearts and his saving power and energy, 
that you would enable us to live lives that are fully pleasing to him, that we would walk around each day in our daily living in a way that is worthy of him and brings glory to him and pleases him. And Father, we know that when you answer that prayer, we rejoice to know that we'll be bearing fruit in every good work. We rejoice to know that, that we'll be increasing in our knowledge of you again and again. We rejoice to know that you will continually strengthen us so that we can run the marathon, endure to the end, and that just moment by moment, we're not going to be walking around leading miserable little grumpy complaining lives where we're a misery to ourselves and everybody around us, but we're going to be one of those happy, joyful people even in the midst of suffering. We're like Paul and Silas in the prison in, in, in Philippi, we, we find reason even in change to sing and be happy uh, because that's what you produce. Lord, this is my prayer for these good folks and my prayer for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to being back next week. God bless you.